Let me first of all say thank you for allowing me and Brenda to come and minister to you today. You know, uh, I've got to say that uh, a while ago when the gentleman was reading the words after or before the communion, uh, some great things were said there. It's just not something that we do. It's not just a motion that we go through. It has a lot of meaning to it. But isn't it the same way with this thing we call Christianity? It's just not something that's convenient. It has to be more than that. You know, since I haven't been pastor for the last seven years, I've been allowed, and, and I've really enjoyed it, attending wherever I want to go. We're good. If I want to get up and go to the Baptist church down the road, I go to the Baptist church down the road. Of course, there's no Nazarene churches down where I live. And I go to all these different churches but yet when I go to a Nazarene church and to all the other churches, I hear a lot of the same thing. Because it has to do with not the denomination, but with who we are as Christians. And something that I hear all the time is the church isn't what it used to be. The church is not what it used to be. We have to be careful there. When we say that, because do we realize what is the church? The church is not this building. The church is not a denomination. The church is the body of Christ. So when you and I say it's not what it used to be, who does it look back on? Us. See, I'm throwing myself in there too because I'm a part of this. You're a part of this. When we allow it to be stated the church does not have the power it used to have, what are we saying? Now, we have to look at it in this manner because it's definitely not God's fault. Malachi, God said, I change not. Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's not God's fault. I want you to turn with me, and, and this is not where I'm preaching. It's just a free little mini-sermon I'm throwing in here. Because we're getting started. And I'm going to take my watch off and lay it down, which doesn't mean a thing. Yeah. But I'm going to lay it right there where I can look at it. But I want us to, to in, in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about the Word. What? The Word. This is what it says. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharp. So you can get it all in it. Living and powerful and sharp. They need a two-edged sword. Let me throw this in right quick. You'll never master this book. I don't care how, how smart you are. This is one book you'll never master. This book is living. It is alive. This, I can read a passage today and then turn around and read it next week and it'll have new meaning. Yeah. How can that be? It's alive. This word is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper. Listen to what he says here. Piercing even. Now I want you to get this. To the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. My lands. 
It affects every area of every person's being. The spiritual, the soul, the spirit. It affects the physical, the joints and the marrow. The marrow gives the life, makes the blood, which gives us the life. And then it goes to the intents and thoughts. We're an open book. Do you realize that this word is so powerful that, you know, we talked about it before we took communion. If you take it, it can make you sick. This can also make you well. This word is powerful. Now I want you to realize, the word has not changed. If anything has happened, it's how we preach the word, how we receive the word that has changed. God has not changed. I don't have a right to change what this word says. I do not have the authority. Even though I've gone and I've been ordained, and I, I have not the right to change the Word of God. The Word of God is what it is. It is living, powerful. It will cut to the very heart and intent. Do you have any thought about that? The intent of the heart and the thoughts of mind. Yeah. God knows everything about me. He knows everything about me. This Word will reveal it. what we need. It will reveal what God needs to do in us. But who holds the key to that? We do. How do we accept it? So in saying that the church is not what it used to be, my lands, it's not God, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's not any of the Trinity, it's not the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it is not the Word. So why is it different? It has to be us. I think we can find some help here. This is where the sermon really starts. It's over in Matthew chapter 17. And I would like for you to stand with me in honor of reading the Word this morning. This is actually our text. We've been building, getting to where we're going. I wanted to lay a foundation and let you see. And now we're going to look into the lives of the disciples and Jesus. And we're going to look at something. And, you know, they've dealt with the same thing that we're dealing with. Isn't that amazing? Look at verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often fire, falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. We'll go back there. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? What's changed? Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's me and you. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you just now and we come into your presence once again, God, we just ask that you will bless this morning the very preaching of the Word. Help me, Father, for I can do absolutely nothing without you. Open every heart and mind to receive the truth, for without that, they'll receive nothing. Give us freedom to act upon what you show us. And Father, help us today to leave this place changed. Better. Walking closer to you. Being everything that you want us to be. And have the power to do the things, God, that you so desperately need us, the church, to be in this day. 
And we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we ask it and we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Now, that verse 14, He brought them to the disciples, but they could not cure Him. That's a sad verse in the Bible. Because these guys could do that. If you go back in your Bible and you turn back to Matthew chapter 10, you'll see where Jesus installs upon them and gives them the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, do anything, cast out demons, do all these things in His name. And He sends them out. Now, not to their own country. That's a preaching in its own self. But He sends them out and then He goes to their place. You say, well, that's fine, preacher, and I understand that, but you're talking about the apostles here. Now, there's a little bit of difference between the apostles and them. Well, let's turn over to Luke chapter 10 and look, and he sends out 70, two by two. <laughs> he sends them out with the same power to go do the same thing that the others have done. So it's not just to the apostles that he gave this. He says it's for everybody. This is something that should be in his church. Now these guys have the power to cast out demons, to do all these things, and they've done it. They've had the power since chapter 10. They've been doing it. Now, something happens from the place of chapter 10 and on up until verse or chapter 17, something takes place in these guys' life. Because now they're unable to cast out this demon and they privately go to Jesus. We read that. Isn't that amazing? They were embarrassed. They pulled him under the side and say, why couldn't we do that? You say, well, he said because of unbelief. Yes, it was unbelief. Where was their unbelief? Well, first of all, you've got to back up just a little bit and you have to go into chapter 16 to find out what has happened in, chap in going into chapter 17. And chapter 16 starts off in a wonderful way. Jesus asked them a question. He says, uh, who do the people say? And some of them say, well, some says you're Elijah. Some says you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said, but I want to ask y'all a personal question. Isn't it amazing how Jesus gets personal? Let me ask you boys a personal question. But who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? See, I could preach there 30 minutes. Who is Jesus to you? Who is He? That, that Peter, I, I'm amazed. Peter's always saying things. He kind of reminds me of myself. He's loud mouthed. He don't know when. He's always got something to say. And he said this: "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Jesus says, "Blessed are you, Simon Peter." He said, "For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven." So what you have only seen me, Peter, because God has revealed to you who I am. Do you realize how blessed we are to recognize who Jesus is? Yeah. You say, well, God's never revealed anything to me. Oh, yes, He has. If you're saved today, He revealed Jesus to you. He revealed salvation to you. He revealed those things, but He wants to do a whole bunch more. See, I'm afraid what's happened in the church is we are saying, okay, I'm saved. And we hang on to that, but then we forget what else we're supposed to do. And now, so here we are right there in that part, and Jesus and Peter stands up, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus says, well, this is great. I can really begin to share some things with you. And He comes down there, and He gets here, and He says to Peter and the twelve, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show. <coughs> it's 
So when Jesus started this, he said, okay, it's time for me to reveal something. And I want you to understand, we do the same thing. He does the same thing with us. I'm going to give you something. This is what he gives <clears throat> He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In the Greek, began to show, began to rebuke, means there become an argument, a confrontation. At this point, Jesus began to show. At this point, Peter began to rebuke. Now, think about this. Peter is arguing with Jesus, and what does he just proclaim? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Lord. And Peter begins to rebuke him. And he says, no, it's not going to be that way. It's not going to happen that way. And do you know what Jesus says? Listen to these words. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are not, you are an offense to me, and you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Satan was using, he said, Peter, what you don't understand is Satan's using you. He's setting a trap for me through you, and you're trying to hinder me from doing what God wants me to do. So in the, in the body, we're either going to be a help or we can be a hindrance. Here's the thing. If we don't obey the Lord and walk with Him, we become a hindrance. If we live in submission and walk with Him and surrender to Him and allow Him to have His way in our lives, we become what God wants us to be. The church can be everything it wants to be. God can use the church then to help people in need, desperate need. I guarantee you somewhere in the in the streets of Jacksonville, there's somebody, some drug addict that needs freedom. I guarantee you there is somebody out there who is lost and needs to be saved. I guarantee you there are people all over this community that needs and desperately wants, but they cannot receive because many go to church and they go through the motions and they never sense the real power that should be there to deliver. I didn't come here today to fuss at you. I didn't come here today to holler at you. I didn't come here in any way to get, I have no idea what's going on in Jacksonville, Arkansas. The Lord gave me this message for this church this morning. Think about it. Just a message. It's a light. Because when I preach this to you, I'm preaching it to me. It is easy to sit back. I've been listen to it. So they argued. And finally Jesus says, I'm getting nowhere. He grabs three of the most influential disciples. He jerks them up on the Mount of Transfiguration is what we call it. We all know what happens there. Elijah and Moses comes down and there they are and they oh, Peter says, let us build a tabernacle. Oh man, let's just, let's just have a church up here. Let's have a great time. You know what? God comes on the scene. Then, just thundering voice, Peter, shut up. I'm transferred. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. 
Peter, you need to just get quiet, push yourself out of the way, and you need to listen to what Jesus is trying to tell you. Boy, does that strike on me. I have to find me shutting my mouth, pushing myself aside, and listening to him. That's the only way I can really hear him. If I get myself completely out of the picture, then I can hear him. That's it. So here they are. They go through all this. And as they're coming down, and I want you to notice this. God has spoke to them. And they're starting down the mountain. And Jesus said in verse 9, or verse 9, Matthew writes, he says, Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. His message has not changed. His goal has not changed. He said, now guys, listen to me. I'm going to die. But I'll rise again. God has said, be quiet, Peter. Listen, this is my son. You listen to him. They've all seen They have seen Elijah and Moses. And oh, I skip that important part. And they heard what they were talking about. You know what they were talking about? His dissension, which he must make at Jerusalem. They were talking about his death at Jerusalem. They come down and said, Jesus, this is the plan. We know. And Jesus said, this is the only way. It's God's plan. I've got to be crucified. That's what they talked about. That's what this whole trip to the mountain was all about. It's to help these guys get a hold of what Jesus has been trying to tell them. I could preach another hour and a half. Listen. How many times does God come spend? How much time does He spend on us trying to get us to see and accept something He's shown us in our lives? He'll take you to the mountaintop. He'll have things come to you and tell you and remind it to you and show it to you and confirm it in His Word. Listen, if you can't find it in that Word, throw it out. If it's, listen, it's, he will back it up. He will take time to get you to understand. God wants us to obey. They come down to the mountain. All this is in their mind. Now I look at it from this side and I'm thinking, how in the world could they not get this? Yet probably if I'd have been there, I'd have done the same thing. Knowing me. You know what happened? Get down there. They still can't figure out what's going on. No, they have no power. They've lost it. Now this is what scares me. You can look. You can something search. You can look after now, realize now that each chapter of each letter is not in chronological order in each book. I mean, Matthew's writing his as the events happen. And then, you know, you may find something over in Mark that's before this. So you can't go. But I mean, in the life and time after the transfiguration, I want you to look and see if you can see where the disciples does another miracle on their own. And there is none until after Pentecost. And we all know what they've been through. Jesus has been crucified. He has risen again. He tells them to tarry until the day of Pentecost. Where they will receive the Holy Spirit. It happens. And you know what? They finally get it. And what happens? The church gets on fire. And there are more miracles 
going on. In the New, in, in the New Church Testament, in Acts, all the books that what Jesus did recorded. Because now the church is on fire and they are getting with it. Why? Because there's no longer this blockade. The blockade is over with. I'm at the very heart of this service that if you've been listening, I want you to listen to this. Let me ask you a personal question. Who is Jesus? To you, who is Jesus? To you, what is his work? Let me ask you, where are you personally? Are you a stronger Christian now than you've ever been? Is your prayer life more powerful than it's ever been? Are you doing more for him than you've ever done? If the answer to that, any of those, are no, then something is blockading your life. Somewhere Jesus has tried to reveal something to you on a personal level and you have argued with Him like Peter and one more time Jesus has brought you to a place and He's bringing it to your mind. I'm telling you, if it's there, He's going to show it to you right now. You're going to know what it is beyond a shadow of a doubt. It, it can vary all through your life. It can be something personal that you're doing that He wants you to give it up. It can be a habit in your life that he's saying it's time to stop it. It can be something in your, you know, it can be anything. It's, this is between you and the Lord. And he comes to you, he puts his finger on the Word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes into your body, it affects your body. See, God has, he has a right to tell you what's good for your body and what's not. He has a right to tell you what you need to do in your spiritual life. He knows every thought that you think. And then He knows why you do the things that you do. What you know. And if He's brought any of these to you, and He said, look, you need to deal with this. This now doesn't need to be. And you begin to argue, why not Jesus? No way. Now, you know, and you begin to try to rationalize it like Peter did not. God surely wouldn't do this. Now, God couldn't want me to do this. No. Uh, no. And you may have even turned on the TV and there was some make you feel good preacher all the time that doesn't preach cross. So that's okay. But still, you've got that voice of God in your heart and mind, and you know it's Him. And He's saying, that's the You know what? I'm not going to tell you you're not going to make it to heaven. That's not my, my business. That's God's business. I believe we're saved, we're saved. But I also believe the person can back A little harder work than what we used to preach it is. I've, I've seen now. It might take a person a little bit longer to backslide than what I used to think. You know, used to, it was, man, if you do one of those things, you're out there, books written out. Well, my page would be so more. I'd have hundreds of pages. If every time I disagree with God and He wiped my name off, I would have so many pages marked, blotted out with my name that it would be unbelievable. But I believe a person can turn away and go by. The Bible teaches it. But I think God will go to the utmost to try to save you, to get you back. Hey, you're His child. He loves you. Jesus died for you. So don't just think He's just going to give up on you like that. He's not. I am a witness to that. But if He's talking to you about something, it's not going to go away. 
without him trying. Try. But you want you to hear this real close. Every time you say no, it's just a little bit harder. You finally, God heals a person.
Church, I want you to do something for me this morning. If you're walking exactly where you need to be with God, I want you to come down here. And I want to pray with you. If you're still battling with Him, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I just want you to just pray there where you're at. I want you this morning, church, will you do that for me? Would you come right now? Let's pray with these that are here. I'm not even going to pay any attention to who's here and who's not, and it's none of my business. But I want to touch heads for these that have come. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before You just now in this place, God, we realize today more than we ever have in all of our life how dependent we are upon You. Jesus, if You had not died on the cross, none of us would have any hope. But You did die on the cross. You gave Your life for us. You rose again. You said as you was hanging on that cross, it is finished. We sang that this morning. It is finished. It's over with. All I have to do now is accept what God has done for me and just let Him guide my life. The Bible's finished. Oh yeah, there are going to be wars in our life. There's going to be troubles. There's going to... But you're going to be there. You've already won it for us. And you're going to help us as we battle in prayer and as we, we do the things, God, that you have for us to do. And Lord, then there's those here this morning that has come and said, Lord, you spoke to me. I know it. I've been arguing I've been pushing it aside. I've been trying to make excuses. And God, for them that is kneeling at this altar right now, and that's what they're talking about, and they're here before you, and they're saying, Father, I say, okay, Lord, I'm through arguing. I accept it. Now, Father, help me as I leave this place to know that I am right where you want me to be. And now, once again, the power can flow through my life. The devil's going to have to, in the morning, he's going to say, oh, no, he's awake and he's going again. I'm not going to worry about what the devil's going to do. The devil needs to worry about what we're going to do. He's defeated. And Lord, right now, I pray for each one of these that has come and said, okay, Lord, it's, I, I'm giving it to you, God, right now. Would you bless them? Would you give them assurance within their heart and life right now? You have heard them. You've accepted it. And you're saying, okay, well, let's go. Father, thank you for them. And Lord, if there's one person leaving here this morning that's still arguing, Pray God you will not let them escape this message, but it will burn in their hearts and their minds. And tonight before they go to bed, they're going to remember it. They're going to remember it when they sit down to eat. They're going to remember it Monday morning when they get up to go to work. They're going to remember it all week. Every time they turn around, they're going to remember it. Until they say, yes, Lord. Lord, I thank You for this church. And I pray, God, as they search for their pastor, that You will send them a man that is Your man for this hour in this church. It will be God appointed. Blessed of God and used by Him. Now, Father, thank You for this opportunity today. What a day it's been. And as we leave this place, not Your presence, watch over us, care for us, and have Your way. 
every day in our lives. In Jesus' name. We all ask it and we pray. And we all sit together. Amen.